Alright, this is Mrs. Winstead, and I am going over the final review for the Advanced Physical Systems class. Um, over here are all the formula triangles that you will have for your final exam, and I will show you how to use a couple of those on uh, the problems that we have up ahead. Well, starting with problem one, um, we have five different graphs that you need to produce. This one is walking, stopped, and then ran back. This one is walking and then started running in the same direction. This one is running, stopped, and walked back. Notice the difference here in the angle of the line. That's a shallower slope here versus a steeper slope. The steeper the slope, the more running we're looking at. Um, I know that we have curved lines on that graph chart, but um, those are harder to produce in the test program, so you may not see curved lines, you may just see a steeper angle. This one is running at a constant speed, so notice the line does not change slope, and this is standing still. Alright, for number two, they were either line graphs or bar graphs, it's just a reminder here, but line graphs you will have any time you have two sets of numbers, so if you're graphing two quantitative pieces of data, or if you're graphing height versus weight, those are going to be line graphs. If you only have one set of numbers, like we do for C and D, or you're comparing categories of information, you would use a bar graph. For number three, remember that quantitative is numbers and qualitative is other types of descriptors. For number four, an observation is just based on what you see. An inference is when you guess something beyond that. So if you assume that you wear this on your hands, then that would be an inference. For number five, I'm asking you to define these using your notes, your book, and or your brain. These are all words that we have experienced during the course of the semester. Alright, for acceleration or no, if you are driving in a straight line, the cruise control is on, you're going at a constant speed and in a constant direction, which means you have no acceleration. If you change direction or if you speed up or slow down, you are going to have acceleration. If something is falling down a hill, you're going to have acceleration due to gravity. Um, and if something isn't moving, it's not going to have any acceleration. For number seven, you needed to put Newton's first, second, or third law. The third law is any action, reaction, so an oar being pushed backwards while the boat's moving forward, or a baseball hitting the ground and then bouncing back up. First law is going to be an object in motion staying in motion, and second law is going to have to do with how force, mass, and acceleration are related mathematically. For number eight, as the distance between objects increases, the force will decrease. This one is an increase, and then we have an increase here. For number nine, there are a couple of these that we didn't look at. Decimeters fall between centimeters and meters, and hectometers fall between meters and kilometers, so hectometers are a little bit bigger. <coughs> so for the conversion question, you first need to take what you were originally given, which is 258 inches, and put that just over the number one. That's the first step to a conversion problem. Next, you need to take these conversion factors that you have and turn them into fractions as well. So 2.4 centimeters in one inch, 2.4 centimeters in one inch, 100 centimeters in one meter, 100 centimeters in one meter. You have to keep these together. You cannot separate them. And then just make sure that things cancel out appropriately. You have inches on top and bottom here, so those do cancel out. And you have centimeters on top and bottom here, so those do cancel out. So you would do 258 times 2.4 divided by 100 should end up with 6.6 .6 meters. Similar thing here, except I do not give you the conversion factors because you need to know how much time units work. So you need to know there are 24 hours in a day, 60 minutes in an hour, and 60 seconds in a minute. That's just kind of common knowledge that you need to have. Again, start with the original unit that you have, put it over 1, then break it down to the next smallest thing. So we have 24 hours in one day, days cancel out, we're left with hours. Now we're going to get rid of hours using 60 minutes in one hour. Then we do minutes. And our final unit that we should have left over is seconds. So you just multiply across 3.38 times 24 times 60 times 60, 292,032 seconds. All right, for number 11, you measure mass with a triple beam balance and volume with a graduated cylinder. You need to come up with your own comparisons for number 12. Think about how big those are. 
And for number 13, you needed to list three from your knowledge. And as a hint, if you go back to question nine, there are actually several there for you. For number 14, the independent variable was the number of batteries. So think about the thing that the person changed for the experiment. And then for the thing that was measured for the experiment, that was the speed of the car. All right, for your hypothesis in question number 15, you needed to come up with the independent variable and the dependent variable first. Those were the two things that you need to have. And then you build your hypothesis around that. So you do if Jeremy adds more or less, you can choose whichever of the independent variable, then the dependent variable will be lower or higher. So that's the way that your hypothesis needs to be set up. It's if prediction, independent variable, then prediction, dependent variable. You can actually switch that and have the prediction first, but the independent variable needs to come after the if, and the dependent variable needs to come after the then, which means you do need to identify those before you write your hypothesis. What we saw from the graph is that more salt increases the boiling temperature, and that makes the water hotter. Maybe it'll cook the pasta faster. It also makes your pasta taste better. So if you haven't been salting your pasta water, I would recommend starting to do that now. All right. For unit two, delta P is change in position. Remember that delta means change in and P is position. So just kind of translating that to words. Your formula for that is PF minus PI. The big difference is that distance is how far you go and it cannot be negative. The dependent variable is always graphed on the y-axis of a graph, and the independent variable on the graph shown for number 20 is distance. Okay, so we're going to take a look at this word problem over here. What is the speed of a jet plane that travels 3,500 meters in 12 seconds? So we're going to be using the speed formula triangle, which is right here. It does not have acceleration in it. That's what differentiates it from the acceleration formula triangle over there. And we have two different numbers in the problem that I'm going to go ahead and pull out. We need to figure out what those are equal to. Because this is in seconds, it is a time. So t equals 12 seconds. And because this is in meters, it is a distance. To know what these equal to, you need to know what these units actually mean. So you need to understand your units. For figuring out our formula, to figure out your formula, we're going to be solving for the one thing we don't have. We have distance and we have time. We are solving for velocity. So it'll be V equals, and what you do is you cover up the V and look at what you have left. We have D over T, because D is on top and T is on the bottom. That means it's going to be D divided by T. It is like this with every single formula triangle. So if you're solving for M, it's going to be FW divided by G. If you're solving for this, it's going to be P divided by V. If you're solving for this, it's going to be V divided by T. It's all about the location of the letters within the formula triangle. For your substitution, we're going to do 3,500 divided by 12. And then that will get you your answer in meters per second. You will be keeping both of those units. All right, so next we have another problem using the speed formula triangle. Time is in hours. Velocity is in miles per hour. Remember, for velocity, you're going to have two units. You'll have miles per hour or m slash s or km slash h, something that has two different units in it, both a distance and a time. We do not have d, so that's what we're solving for. If we cover this up, we have V next to T. That actually means that we are going to multiply. So D equals V times T in this case. So a little bit different than our previous problem. And then you're going to go ahead and multiply that out. So you would do 48 times 5 to get your answer. All right, number 23, go ahead and ignore it actually should have been removed from your review. It's not something we went over. For number 24, you're going to need to calculate the slope of the line, which you should know how to do from algebra, but just as kind of a refresher. You're going to put two points on that line. I'd recommend places where the line crosses a corner. 
you will follow from where the points are over to the y-axis to find your numbers for y2 and y1. Then you'll do the same thing with the x-axis, find x2 and x1. Your formula is y2 minus y1, and then divided by x2 minus x1. Alright, to find average speed, it's just total distance divided by total time. If something is slowing down in the positive direction, it has negative acceleration. Slope on a position versus time graph is equal to speed. On a speed versus time graph, slope is equal to acceleration. Um, and then for this one, point 0.3 was the one you were looking for, and then point 0.2 was the one you were looking for for there. For number 31, remember to describe what is happening. This is a speed versus time graph. It actually appears on the next page, so you may have used the graph on the current page. Um, it's not a big deal as long as you know how to read both the speed versus time graph that's on the next page and the position versus time graph that's on the current page. Um, for that second graph, A was speeding up, B was constant, and C was slowing down. It's a little bit different with a speed versus time graph. Alright, so then you need to find the instantaneous speed, so you would put a point on the, I don't know why I said car, but alright, um, put a point on the line at the 40 centimeter line there from the x-axis. You would go from the x-axis, you'd go up to the 40 centimeter line, you put your point, and then you make your tangent line, and you put a second point and find the slope. For number 33, if you go back to question number 24, I'm asking you to give me the directions for how you solve for... S All right, so this is a motion scenario. I already went through and highlighted those important motion words to keep track of. We're going to use those to make two different graphs and then to answer a word problem. You'll probably have something like this on your final exam. I recommend looking for these words. That's what's really important here. So we start by driving on a road going 50 miles per hour that is at a constant speed. So I'm going to do a line here that shows that it's a constant speed. For a speed versus time graph, a constant speed is going to look more like that because you are not accelerating so your velocity doesn't change. Then we slow down. So to slow down, we're going to have just a more kind of shallow slope there. For this one, we're actually going to slow down by going toward the zero line because your acceleration is negative, so your speed is decreasing, so it heads down to zero here. Then we have a stop. So a stop on a position versus time graph is just a horizontal line. On a speed versus time graph, that horizontal line must be on zero in order for that to be a stop. Once the light turns green, you drive at an increasing speed, so now we're going to show speeding up. You can either do a curved line up or just kind of a steep angle. For this one, you don't have to curve your line at all. It's just going to be a diagonal line coming away from zero, so speeding up is away from zero. Slowing down is towards zero. That's the same on the positive or negative side. So this is slowing down. This is speeding up. So towards zero is slowing down. Away from zero is speeding up. Okay, and then we're driving at a constant speed again. So we go back to that and we go to that here. Okay. So then we're going to use that previous motion scenario and the numbers from it to solve a word problem. This is asking about the acceleration approaching the stoplight. So we were at 50 miles per hour as our speed. We dropped to zero miles per hour and it took 10 seconds. Now technically, because we went from zero, we went, um, our final speed was zero we went to fifth we had 50 before so technically this is actually going to be negative 50 miles per hour for the velocity here because we slowed down by that much the change in velocity was negative so anytime you're slowing down your delta v is going to be negative and then our time was 10 seconds so you're solving for acceleration which is A equals V over T, just like before. You should be able to solve it out from there. All right, this will continue in another video with question number 37.